Hello, everyone. This is Gabriel in my office at the University of Notre Dame, here to introduce to you the latest episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible, in which I speak with a remarkable person and scholar, Dr. Shadi Nasser of Harvard University, about the transmission of the Quran. If you have any interest in how the Quran was initially transmitted in the very earliest stages, so speaking about the Prophet's own companions, um, and the subsequent history of the text and its variants. Why are there variants to the Quran? What do they consist of? Uh, what were the reasons for their appearance? And how were they systematized by later Islamic tradition? Uh, if any of that interests you, then this episode and discussion will really interest you. Uh, I'm so grateful you're here. Thank you for joining. Please take a moment to subscribe to this channel. I don't make a penny off of it, but it gives me encouragement to continue to um, produce this sort of content. Also, after you subscribe, please hit that bell button so you're notified of future content. And if you like this discussion with Professor Nasser, please um, like the video. Thank you so much. Hello, Dr. Shadi Nasser. Great to have you with us. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah terrific. So I'm really excited uh, that you're here with us on Exploring the Quran. And uh, the Bible, I'm not sure why I'm saying yes, I'm giving myself the royal uh, we, the, the plural. Uh, so I thought I'd just go through a brief introduction, a sort of formal introduction. Um, we know each other quite well, and um, but many may not know all of your accomplishments. So I'll mention just a little bit of your bio and books, and then we'll get right into a conversation uh, about the Quran, its transmission and Quranic variants. So is that okay as a plan? Sure, sure, of course, okay. yes. Great. So everyone, Dr. Shadi Nasser is Associate Professor of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at Harvard University. He teaches Arabic literature and Islamic civilizations courses. His previous posting was as a university lecturer in classical Arabic studies at the University of Cambridge in the UK in the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies. And I think before that you were at Yale. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yes. So uh, not, not bad. Uh, Harvard, Yale, Cambridge, Harvard. Is, is that the right order? Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's that's the right order. Yeah. So it, it was, let's say it was luck. Yeah. <laughs> I mentioned Harvard first because Dr. Nasser started his PhD at Harvard uh, under the supervision of Wolfhard Heinrichs and completed that PhD in 2011. Uh, 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 Professor Nasser's research interests are Quranic studies generally, but with a particular focus, as we will soon see on the history of the transmission of the text, its language, and its reception among the early Muslim community. He also works on pre-Islamic and early Islamic poetry, akhbar literature, hadith transmission, uh, and his publications are many, and, uh, and a number of prominent articles uh, in all, all the uh, most significant places. But I'll just mention um, his two monographs, uh, first in 2012 from Brill, the transmission of the variant readings of the Quran, the problem of Tawetur, and the emergence of Shuaz. And then again with Brill in 2020, the second canonization of the Quran uh, with uh, the subtitle of Ibn Mujahid and the founding of the seven readings. Did I get that mostly right? How, how was that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Yeah, that was fine. Yes. Terrific. Okay, so I thought we'd just get right into the heart of the matter uh, on exploring the Quran and the Bible, there are a lot of people who are interested in uh, questions of uh, not only the Quran's origins and its relationship to earlier literature, but its transmission, and in particular, the question of, you know, do, does the Quran have variants? What, what does it mean to speak of Quranic variants? So I just thought we'd start there. Um, so when someone speaks, someone says a Quranic variant, what, what does that mean? Could you elaborate? Sure. Okay, so... <clears throat> So I think to start with, it's important to um, to talk a little bit about the word variant. Uh, I mentioned, I always try to mention um, that as footnotes in, in, in articles um, that we use variant in Western scholarship and it became a custom that we say uh, variants. Um, in the Islamic literature, the word variant doesn't exist. So they you only say qira'a, which is a reading. And I think hopefully one day we will be able to say readings in um, in Western literature without using the word variant. And, and the reason for that is probably when you are saying variant, you are assuming that there's an origin, okay? Uh, now, of course, if you want to go the secular path, you would say, well, there must be an origin and then variants are emerging from this origin. 
uh, in the case of the Quran, there's no, um, uh, we don't have the sense that Muslim scholars were taught about origin, the majority of them. Okay, so there's no such thing as an, an Ur text or an original text from which these variants um, evolved or mutated. Uh, except for uh, probably a strand in the Shia tradition where they do contend that there must be an original version or an, an ur text. And there's only one qira'a. There are no such thing as multiple qira'at. Okay. So that's just a clarification for, for, for right. the variant. Yeah. You wanted to ask something or? Um, no, yeah. keep, keep, keep going and I'll follow yeah. after Right. So, um, so, so I think, I mean, we can, we can discuss that and what, what it means, but this is just a, um, a footnote, if you want, on the word variant, that when we are using it, uh, does it mean that there is an original word or there is an original reading, um, at least the way that we deal it? In the Islamic scholarship, there, the readings are equal, at least uh, what came to be known as the canonical readings or the standard readings. So they are equal in status. They are divine. If you have a word which has two or three or four or even five readings, they are all equal in status. So it's either we don't know how the prophet read them or we assume that he approved of all these readings, the three or four or five of them. Probably some, some there are some verses with the with, uh, at least five or six verses or six readings is canonical in a sense. Uh, so that's what what a reading is. Now, if you um, uh, if if you are if you are a textual critic and you want to sit with the text and say, well, I think the original reading is this because this is what um, uh, Arabic grammar um, instructs us to, to read the text. I don't care about the tradition. I'm just sitting in front of the text and this must be the original reading and the other readings evolve from it. That's also, that's another story. Uh, so you, there's some kind of tension here, if you want, between what the tradition teaches and what uh, textual critic. A te textual critic doesn't have to be a Western critic. It could be a grammarian and all Arab grammarians. There has always been tension between the Quran readers and Arab grammarians, especially the early ones, because many of the early Arab grammarians, they were um, rejecting some of the canonical readings because they were, they considered them not to be grammatical. Um, uh, so so in a nutshell, a reading or a variant reading, so you have a word and um, and there are multiple ways of reading it, whether uh, uh, pronouncing it, whether it's a, a variation of a dialect, whether it's syntactical, the syntactical function is different. Um, is it a subject? Is it an object? Um, is it a uh, the conjugation of the verb could be different? Um, uh, so is it active? Is it passive? Uh, is it a noun? Is it a verb? Um, so because the uh, early Quranic uh, script it didn't have a, a fully developed system of uh, vowels, um, the flexibility of uh, reading these words gave um, way to having all these different variant readings, uh, or what we are calling variant readings or qiraat. Yeah. This is terrific. Okay, so it's it's actually pretty complicated to to sort through. I think for well, maybe for everyone. I mean, even for for me, reading reading your work in preparation for our conversation, I realized well that the, there are a number of ways in which the question is complicated. But for people, um, whether whatever background they're coming from, who are you know not um, well read in these questions, uh, there are all sorts of complications. Um, so I don't I, I don't know where the best place to start is, but w w what if what if we return to the notion of I mean the, the sorts of variants you're speaking about um, are as I understand it variants on the so-called Uthmanic text. Correct. Yeah. So just if we if I can just remind if you don't mind if I do it just remind um, viewers that the the tradition is that an authoritative consonantal text so basic text sometimes called in the defective script, not sure if you like that term, uh, was established by the third caliph. So somewhere um, somewhere between um, 644 and 656. 
uh, CE. Um, and um, in principle, the, the, uh, there, were, there were other competing uh, codices that presumably existed before then. So most famously, Ubay ibn Mas'ud and Ali ibn Abi Talib. Um, but he at least, according to the accounts, sought to suppress or destroy those variants. Um, and, and so when we speak about variants, at least the way you, you were in your introductory remarks, we're speaking about variants to that Uthmanic text. Is, is that okay? And do you want to elaborate or comment on what I've just said? Or? No, absolutely, you're absolutely correct. So my uh, so variants, again, uh, they encompass what I described at the beginning. And the variants, or let's call them textual variants or, or variants of the codices that you also described. So the bigger umbrella is variants. Uh, but even in Arabic, even in Arabic, they are still called qiraat. Everything, whether they agree with the consonantal, with the Uthmanic consonantal text, or whether they don't agree, they are all qiraat. And um, and there are multiple ways of, um, of uh, there are different words, if you want, or different vocabulary. So they would say, let's take Ubay bin Ka'b, for example. Okay, So in the manuals, you would have fi qira'at Ubay, according to Ubay's reading, or fi uh, mushaf Ubay in his mushaf okay okay so uh, we have the term fi uh, mushaf ubay and we have also the term fi qira'at ubay and we have also fi harf ubay so harf uh, uh, comes from the seven ahruf or the sab'at ahruf and it's also an ambiguous term we don't know exactly what a harf is uh, but it is also used so all these uh, terms they refer to a qira'a or a variant reading um, be it uh, w whether it agrees with the rasm with the Uthmanic rasm or it doesn't agree with it so even in uh, the canonical readings you would have the same thing so you would have in early works fi uh, qira'at asim for example or sometimes fi harf asim they would also use the word harf um, you wouldn't they wouldn't use fi mushaf asim uh, or fi mushaf uh, nafi, uh, they would use um, the probably the regional codex, like the Kufan, Masahif al Kufa, or uh, Masahif al Medina. Uh, so the companions, these early, the pre Uthmanic companions, if you want, they had their own Masahif or their own codices. And um, yes, most of them probably were destroyed, uh, but somehow they, some of some of these codices, they survived or copies of them and Muslim scholars were using them. Uh, they were copying sometimes readings from them. Uh, they were still circulating, maybe you know, secretly or uh, uh, just as tokens or as relics from the past that some people were keeping them. Uh, right. Because yeah. we knew that, yeah. they, that so, they had access to them. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, to, sorry to jump in. I, I just, I mean, this is a really important and interesting element to the story of the transmission of the text because the fig the companions in question uh they're not i mean correct me if i get this wrong but they're not considered problematic figures they're faithful companions so Ubay ibn Mas'ud and Ali just to take those three and I know there are others um and uh whereas ironically and i don't want this to take a polemical tinge but just sort of straightforward discussion you know Uthman is perhaps a problematic figure mm -hmm. uh so um you could you could imagine someone you know a couple of generations later or maybe a century later after the formation of the Uthman codex saying well, well no if uh a reading in ibn masud is grammatically or theologically appropriate um, you know what? What's the problem? Why should I be compelled by Uthman's uh, codex? Could, yeah, could you comment on that? Okay, that's a big question. Um, so let's start with let's start with with meaning first. Whether a, a, whether a variant or whether a qira'a has a different meaning or or not. Now, there is a trend which says, uh, trying to justify the seven readings or the seven readings, that there's no uh, contradiction between them. The meaning is very similar. And that's not the way to go about it. The readings were not chosen because the, the meaning of one reading agrees with another reading. That's not how 
uh, one should look at it. The criterion for a reading, what to be accepted or not, uh, is whether you can use it in prayer. And and this is really this is really it. It's it's all about ritual prayer. It's not about whether a reading makes sense or not. Okay. And that's something that people miss a lot when they are dealing with the qira'at, especially when you are only working on it on, from a grammatical perspective. Meaning that if you can use a reading while you are praying, then your prayer is valid. And that's the criterion for jurists. Very interesting. Least. Very interesting. So whether Ibn Mas'ud's reading makes sense or not, and many of Ibn Mas'ud's reading and Ubay's reading and many of the non-canonical readings, they many of them, they make more sense than many of the seven readings or the ten readings. And that's a statement by many exegetes and grammarians. But that's not what they are concerned about. They are concerned whether you can use this reading in ritual prayer, whether this is Quran, capital Q, or not. So whether a reading makes sense or not, that's not the criterion. Okay, And for, for Muslim jurists, this is how we receive the text. Uh, this is how... Well, we received it through Tawatur. We can talk about Tawatur if you want later on. But this is how the Muslim generations and Muslim scholars receive the text from the, prof from the Prophet. We take it as is. Later on, try to justify the readings according to our framework. But this is the text. We use it in prayer. It doesn't matter if Ali's reading or Ibn Mas'ud's reading makes more sense or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the legitimacy of the Uthmanic text um does not is not connected to Uthman's own personal ethics or piety uh but reflects a conviction that it was the widely disseminated reading mutawatir maybe um and and well, therefore therefore reflects the prophet therefore is divine revelation and is liturgically appropriate or well it's it's a, it's the chicken and the egg uh okay. mean, meaning meaning that okay Uthman formed a committee um the members of the committee are questionable historical okay um most of them they were not contemporaries with the prophet they were young they didn't even uh, witness the the um uh, the revelation themselves they were all 9 10 11 years old when they died when when the prophet died so they were young um and the senior companions of the prophet, they were still alive and they were not part of that committee. So that's one question mark, okay? So the second point is, okay, well, Uthman formed the committee and they collected the Quran and the companions, they did not object. Well, call, there's a silent ijma, okay? So we don't have from the text um, a statement from the companions that they approved of it. Yeah, Ishmael there is a silent consensus. Ishmael. Yeah, consensus. Yeah. Consensus. So there's a silent consensus uh, that everyone, sure, like Othman probably showed the um, the copies to all the companions. I did, they didn't object, except for Ibn Masoud, uh, who verbally objected to the collection. Uh, and if you want indirect uh, objections by Ali bin Abi Talib and by Ubay, because they still have their own codices, which disagreed with uh, Uthman's codex. So the point of the egg and chicken is that what Uthman collected, is it the mutawatir divine text revealed to the prophet and he compiled it? This is what this is. We know that it is. This is the version that was revealed to the prophet and the companions agreed on it or he collected something. And then there was a consensus later on on it, right? right. Whether whether it is the revealed uh, text or not, because either case, what matters at the end is consensus in Islamic law. Mm. What the only thing that people think that the Quran is the is the most authoritative uh, principle of law or source of law. I mean, it is nominally, but actually, the most powerful. Uh, source of law is consensus. I mean, consensus can even abrogate the Quran itself, and it did. So many of the uh, companions' codices, they are considered to be abrogated. So they were Quran at a certain point, and that's the uh, statement by most early Muslim theologians, that they were Quran at a certain point, the Prophet recited them, the companions recited them, but they were abrogated by Uthman's collection. Mm. Okay, so consensus is the most important element here. 
uh, I'd like to make sure I got that. Yeah. Excuse me. I'd like to make sure I got that point right. So, um, theologically speaking, some of the Masahif or the variant codices readings would be were understood to be Quran mm -hmm. before. Let's just you know uh, choose a date six fifty uh, yeah. when the Uthmanic Codex was established. Of course, because the companions were pray were I mean, okay, of course he was praying and leading other people in prayers according to his own mushaf, mm -hmm. right? According to his own codex. Okay. okay. Uh, and Ibn Mas'ud, I mean the reading of Ibn Mas'ud was still used in Kufa two hundred years after Uthman's codex. People were still praying in Kufa according to the codex of Ibn Mas'ud, not to Uthman. Right. That's that's what the sources tell us. Okay. Uh, and there's the interesting story of Al Hajjaj. People, most people know about it. Is that uh, because Ibn Masoud's reading was very popular, and his Mushaf, his Codex, was very popular in Kufa. Um, he said, "I'm going to erase uh, any copy of Ibn Masoud's uh, Codex that I will find. I'm going to erase it with a with a pig's shoulder." Right, so that the ultimate way of desecrating a Quran Desecrate. is they use a big boulder to to erase it or to efface the text. So the point is that the the companions they were using codices and they were codices before uh, Uthman's, and of course people were using them in prayer uh, even after Uthman. Mm -hmm. uh, the point is what the Muslim scholars um, agreed upon. Uh, and the consensus that they established what is the Quran and what is not the Quran and it took time to establish this consensus that we are only going to adhere to the Uthmanic codices and yes we there there was a codex a mushaf by Ubay by Ali by other companions by Ibn Abbas by Aisha the, the codices are there they are recorded in the sources so they are not a myth but all these and Bakalani put it nicely in his in his um, uh, argument against against that in in Tisar al Quran is that all these codices are abrogated, and we now the ijma the consensus of the Muslim community or Muslim scholars uh, is to use only the regional codices, the Osmanic codices. Yeah, this is great, um, uh, and theologically, it's super interesting to uh, get a better sense of the importance of the of the community and which presumably means a community of scholars uh, just yeah. in terms of uh ach achieving and um and applying the notion of consensus uh so the question of authority being within the community that's probably a whole nother theological conversation to have but yeah the, yeah. the role of you know, of the community itself as a a bearer of theological authority and as yeah, yeah. it's obviously yeah. critical uh, i i wanted there's so many topics i, I don't think we're going to get to them all but um you've written extensively about the uh importance of written transmission of the quran so while we're still yeah, sort of so... in this early period i know your, your your most recent book deals with ibn mujahid so on to the 10th century but um you know it's sometimes you hear a simple maybe simplistic presentation of the transmission of quran that oh later on you get these variants and you know the system of seven or ten different readings uh because um uh the the uh the written transmission is is so poor because the script is defective but mm -hmm. And may, maybe relatively late or some, but you you make the case that no, um, the whole story is more complicated. Written transmission uh, is extensive and early. It, it is, it is. And I mean, this is one of the, again, if you want a dichotomy or tension between oral and written transmission in the Islamic tradition. Um, and I think um, uh, one of the, if you want the, the focus on orality, or memorization of the of the text that um, because Muslim scholars were aware that the script is defective and I don't mind using the word defective because it was defective uh, it took time to develop like all other scripts in the world and Muslim scholars themselves call it defective why shouldn't we call it defective um, and um, uh, because they knew that the script was not able to capture all different nuances 
of recitation. Okay? And it was not able to accurately um, capture all the vowels, all the um, uh, dotting preferences, if you want. Um, they developed this uh, system of what we call oral transmission, in a sense, memorizing the Quran. And the Quran can only be verified through oral means, which is the license or the ijazah from master to student. And you have a whole corpus of literature condemning people who only take their knowledge from books uh, and condemning people who don't go to teachers and professors to learn from them. And they only pick a book and read from it. Um, it's extent in all literature in Arabic, in whether it's even Arabic literature, secular, poetry, uh, adab, or uh, hadith, uh, prophetic traditions, or Quran, or history, etc. Um, so the point of the written transmission is that you have a lot of evidence, whether it's material evidence that people are, are finding now scholars, inscriptions, early manuscripts, um, and even if you don't go to this track of material evidence to see what we had from the 7th century or the 6th century, even what uh, Muslim scholars themselves uh, say about the early period of uh, writing, uh, that we you just talked about the codices, that there were codices before Uthman. I mean, Muslim scholars say that there were written codices before Uthman. It means that they were writing something. And we have a lot of evidence, even from pre-Islamic poetry, uh, that there were means of writing yes they were not writing every single thing on a notebook but they were writing writing was known uh there was a kind of primitive arabic script yes it was taken from nabatean combination with aramaic nabatean etc but there was writing um and all the different stages of uh, the transmission of the quran yes orality was very important and it's still very important but also writing is very important it is so important to the point that it even superseded, if you want, the oral transmission in certain points. So if you have two competing traditions, you have one oral tradition and you have a written uh, tradition, that written tradition wins. So we reached a point where anything that goes against the Osmanic, the Osmanic Codex, even if you have a strong oral transmission from your teacher and from your teacher's teacher, it doesn't matter. What matters at the end of the day is the written codex. Mm -hmm. So anything that deviates from the Osmanic Rasm, from the Osmanic Codex, is rejected by Muslim scholars. It doesn't matter who transmitted it. And, and, and it sounds like there's no there's no question of saying, oh, uh, people began to write about the Qira'at at a certain point, because it, at least the way you're presenting it, there was just a, a continual practice of writing down the revelation, I mean, from the yeah. companions and to the successors. Yeah. From the very beginning, from even from there are many accounts that during the time of the prophet there was writing. He, I mean, he had scribes of the revelation. So what were they doing? It's either we are going to say that many of these accounts are fabricated, and you really don't want to go this way because it's going to be a domino effect. If you are going to reject this account, you are going to discredit some of its transmitters. And if you discredit some of these transmitters, you are going to also discredit them in other narrations. You really don't want to go this way. So the best way is to harmonize uh, these accounts. So there was writing during the time of the prophet. He wrote letters uh, to people. He wrote, he had people to write revelation for him. Uh, there are accounts that he was shif shifting around uh, the order of the verses um, whenever he received new revelation. Um, there were um, uh, accounts about uh, uh, people like Ibn Mas'ud and Ali ibn Abi Talib and Aisha, his wife, that they had copies, their own copies of, uh, of uh, now, whether it's a full-fledged mushaf or scrolls uh, or some kind of uh, only folios, that's, that's another issue. But they were writing down the revelation even during this time. Um, and when the Prophet died, his companions had codices. It seems that they had so many codices that Osman had to burn them all. And uh, otherwise, what would he burn if they were not writing these codices? So you're talking about 20 years between Osman and, and the Prophet, and you had at least what we have, the, the recorded um, accounts of people who had codices, at least 15 of them. 
the companions that they had their own copies. Mm -hmm. um, and you want to imagine that other people had copies of copies as well. So, so of what course, is we the... know that... Sorry, people, please carry on. No, no, I was just going to say, we know that writing was expensive during that time, and it was not as common as writing later on, and material was expensive to for every single household to have a copy. But to a certain extent, we know that they were they were writing something. And, um, and we don't want to dismiss all these accounts to be uh, fabrications, uh, because it's almost a continuous narrative that if you put it together, it, it does make sense. So, yes. Yes. Uh, I just thought I'd follow up with a very specific question that's sort of related, which you, you've commented on. So I, I, I think I may know your answer, but um, it, of course, the story goes that uh, the, Othman was compelled or encouraged to uh, embark on the project that led to the codification of his codification of the Quran, because one of his generals comes from the, the distant frontier I mean, it would take a long time to get back from Azerbaijan or Armenia or wherever it was exactly. I think they're different reports. Hodeifa comes all the way back and says, oh, no, we have this problem because Syrian and Iraqi uh, soldiers are differing over the pronunciation of the Quran. I don't know if laf is the word there or how would they say it. Maybe it's... Well, it's not, I don't think it's pronunciation. It's just they are disagreeing. Disagreeing. So okay. <laughs> yeah. I will check the... I'll have to check it. I would be surprised if it's just love of that. It's only it's about the pronunciation. It 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 should be more something more drastic, more basic. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, presumably, if the situation is as you describe, I mean, back home in Medina, there's plenty of disagreement. Uh, so I mean, one wonders if you needed Hodefa to come in. Uh, yeah, that's that's one point that that uh, you know I I raised and paid attention to is uh, you have. These accounts, yes, there is some historical value to them. There are different reading traditions in Medina. There were different reading traditions in Medina, okay, and different also masahif, and also in Mecca. Let's say the, the bigger the bigger Hijaz, and there are there were different also codices um, and copies in Syria, okay, and in in Iraq at large. So the point is um, saying that people were differing in the Re, they, they had differences in reciting the Quran when Hudayfa is coming to Uthman, there must have been also differences in Medina, uh, because this is what the records uh, show us. Uh, so there must be the the account um, is not, is, is trying, this account of the, the first codification of the Quran is trying to give a justification of why Uthman uh, took this right, um, right. mission. Especially that there is there are certain uh, details about uh, why Hudayfa came and what the, what he told the caliph. He told them, save the Muslim nation, right? Uh, before they are going to be, be, before they differ in reciting the Quran like the Jews and Christians did. So this is a very very theological slash political statement uh, to put in an account, and it shows you how Muslim scholars were very aware of the fact that variations in the Quran uh, are going out of control. Mm -hmm. And the argument that they were using against Jews and Christians, that their scripture is corrupted and falsified, probably the same thing is going to happen to them if they don't do something about it. And this is always was in the back uh, back of the mind uh, of, of Muslim scholars. Even, even the whole literature of variants of Qira'at was one of the tools that um, people like that uh, even in the classical literature that people were attacking Muslim scholars uh, that oh you say that there's only one Quran what about these variations mm -hmm. and this is why Al Baqalani wrote his book and mm -hmm. the Quran is to defend the variant readings the, the and victory or the the triumph of the Quran triumph right of the of the Quran yeah. these questions it's not something that we are only asking today. People were asking them 1,000 years ago. By the way, that that element of the tradition regarding Hudayfa about save us before we're divided as the Jews and Christians are, mm -hmm. is interesting because, I mean, in fact, in late antiquity and continuing into the period of, of early Islam, uh, Christians generally were not divided. I mean, there were lots of canonical variants in different communities had uh, uh, different opinions about, for example, was the Book of Revelation part of the Can New Testament canon. But this didn't tend to be where 
they fought. They tended to fight over Christology, as you know. Um, and that's what makes the difference between Jacobites, Melkites, and so-called Nestorians. But it's just interesting to see that. Uh, but for, when that the possibility of division and internal dissent or um, d uh, uh, yeah, d um, dissension no, I mean, is raised it's, with Islam, it's it's about the Quran. Uh, it's it's not about it's, Muhammad, say, but it, the Quran is the central question. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. And I, I don't want to to go that route. Um, just a, a suggestion because it's very. I don't. I don't like to to completely disc discredit accounts to say that they are fabricated. Um, I like to think of accounts being heavily disseminated or circulating at a certain point. There are there is there always a reason to start circulating an account as a reaction to something, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it was fabricated and then people starting started to disseminate it. But probably it was there. They polished it and they started disseminating uh, heavily this kind of account. So I don't want to dismiss the possibility that when Muslim scholars started to have theological discussions about the integrity of the Quran and vis-a-vis -vis the scriptures of Christians and Jews, that what characterizes the Quran is that it's only one and it's not falsified and it's not corrupted versus this is, this is our point of strength against um, mm -hmm. the Torah or against the New Testament, the Injil, is that they are corrupted. Mm -hmm. So I think we should be also open to the possibility that this account started to circulate uh, and similar accounts when Muslim theologians started to have these debates about the superiority of Islam and the over the other scriptures. Now, there's another detail in this story, and uh, hopefully we're going to get on to Ibn Mujahid soon, but I just want to touch on one detail really maybe quickly we'll see yeah. uh which is the 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 amsar masahif yeah. so i mean the tradition is that um yes Uthman Uthman's codex sort of wins the day but then it's it's sent out more or less to five i, I think there are variants to this some traditions give more but the basic account is it's sent out to five five cities so uh, kufa basra uh, mecca medina and then uh, Damascus or Hims, I guess, Syria sometimes, generally. So, but that they're not all identical, right? So, um, and uh, is that a problem? Is that, uh, how is that solved? Is And is that historical in your opinion? So the tradition, I mean, the tradition doesn't say whether they were identical or not. It's just like he sent copies, okay? Now, we should assume that they were, they must be identical. I mean, it's, they are copies. Okay. So you have, you made, you, you, you codified the text and then you make copies of it. And then you send all these copies to the different regions. It makes sense that they are all the same, especially that, yes, they are mostly all the same. They are very, very similar from the beginning to end, except know, 40 locations or 45 locations. Very, very few. Yeah. And these differences are has to do with particles, with the wa and fa, and uh, is it qala or qol, like a, an alif, or a missing proposition, um, a, a, a missing particle, a huwa, a he, a pronoun. So these differences are, are what we characterize as scribal errors. Now, of course, the tradition doesn't recognize them as scribal errors. There are no scribal errors in the Quran. The, the God is watching over over his final message and over the people who were copying the text. So there is no way that these are scribal errors. And the tradition um, uh, tried to explain these uh, different, um, uh, if you want, 40 to 45 uh, scribal inconsistencies uh, that they were uh, sent in the Masahib al-Amsar because they were qira'at, they were readings. And Uthman uh, and his committee um, intently made these variations and sent them to the different. Uh, again, the the chicken and the egg. Uh, it's like you re you really can't win here. I mean, theolo you are a theologian. You know that the theologians will always find a way to interpret uh, to interpret texts, and uh, you will always find a way to uh, solve contradictions. Um, and whether they are historical or not, I mean, this is what the tradition says, and. We know how the Qira'at developed is that they all go back to uh, to these regions. Uh, yes, there is a, a Basran 
uh, reading based on the Basran Codex, and there is a Kufen reading largely based on the Kufen Codex. But there were also other variations derived from the Uthmanic text or coexisted with the Uthmanic text. Uh, the Hamsi Mus'haf that you were talking, it deviates in, in, in a few locations from the uh, uh, canonical uh, Syrian Codex. And as you said, the tradition, uh, there are different uh, number. There are different numbers for the uh, num for the codices that Osman sent. I think they range between four and eleven, if I'm not mistaken. He either sent four copies and kept the original in Medina, uh, or he sent eleven. And I was saying that it probably it, it makes sense that there were copies more than four or five, because you see in the later um, uh, literature uh, that uh, the readers they were using different masahif. Uh, and different copies. So most probably Asim was using a Mus'haf, which is very similar to the Mus'haf that Hamza was using or Al-A'mash was using, but there are differences. There are locations where you could see that uh, they deviate from the, from the rest, especially someone like Al-A'mash. Uh, or in Al-Basra, you have Al-Hasan Al-Basri, uh, who's a great uh, figure also in, in, in early Islam. He has a reading and he deviates often from the Uthmanic Rasm. And he must have been relying on a copy. And he's early. I mean, he's, he's earlier than the canonical readings in that sense. So I was saying that it does make sense to entertain the idea that there were competing copies. And they were not only this Mustaf al-Imam, the main codex that Osman sent, and everyone was reading from them. There must be copies of copies, copies of copies. Which one was the original Osmanic copy? That's uh, difficult to answer now, at least. That's great. Yeah, very interesting. And it just it reminds me of something, an observation you make. So this is not not mine at all, but that um, theologically speaking, uh, the argument is that um, it, divine providence or God's protection was active throughout this whole process. And you, you quote uh, a Quran and Hijr, so sort of 15 verse 9. Uh, which says we have sent down the reminder and we will preserve it. Wa inna uh, Correct. And although it seems probably that in the Quranic context, that verse is speaking about protection against potential diabolical interference in the process of revelation between God and the Prophet, but that is extended by the exegetes to mean that the whole process is so God continues to be active after the delivery of the revelation in its transmission? 100%. And again, you are a theologian yourself, Gabriel, so you would, you would know that. This is, this is what theologians and exegetes do. They hold the text and they, they stretch it. Yeah. Um, and um, and the, um, the verse that everyone quotes, um, that we sent the revelation or the dhikr. Again, there's a problem of dhikr. Is it the Qur'an or not? But let's assume it is the Qur'an. So we have sent the Qur'an and we are going to protect it. The context of the chapter has nothing to do with textual corruption or with the uh, uh, preservation of the right. Qur'an. As you, as you mentioned, it has to do with, with, uh, with stopping Satan or the devil from interfering in the message. And this theme, if people read early Islamic literature and the whole prophetic mission and the whole struggle between the satanic revelations or what we call even later the satanic verses, but even the struggle that the prophet was uh, having with, with Satan or with the di diabolic um, uh, revelations, they would understand why this verse and other verses were, were uh, mentioned or revealed. So God is assuring Muhammad that his revelations are not diabolic and they are divine. Um, and you have all the literature in the in the um, in in the hadith and the exegetical literature uh, about Gabriel, not not you, but the uh, the, the, the angel Gabriel Jibril, who is uh, coming down with an escort of uh, angels trying to protect the Quran from Satan, shape shifting into an angel to try to change something in the revelation. And you have other um, uh, traditions that say, uh, yes, this means that no one is able to change even a letter from the Quran with a caveat that would change any of its rulings. 
So early exegetes were more concerned about changes that Satan or devil or anyone possessed by the devil, if you want to extend even that, that someone is, who is intently changing something of the Quran, he, he or she is possessed by, by, by the devil, uh, is that they are not going to change anything that would change the meaning or yeah. any of its uh, hudud, any of its legal uh, requirements, etc. Uh, but then exegetes extended that into uh, what we call, what what they call the the textual preservation of the Quran, and God will not allow even the copyists who are copying the Quran to make yeah. to make any slight change, right. uh, even even if it doesn't change the meaning, but. Right. Uh, that's that's God watching over his final yes, message. Yes. So just for as a point of historical accuracy here, uh, I am in the Department of Theology, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. if I'm a theologian, I'm not a good one. <laughs> no, that, that, well, I, no, no, I just humble. studied I studied uh, Islamic studies and never was trained in theology, and so I, if I do it, I fake it. Let's put it that way. That, um, you are you are being very humble, Gabriel. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so, um, yeah, well, I want to at least since we're speaking a little bit about theological interpretations and I, I'm beginning to think that we I might try to convince you to come back so we can just dedicate a whole separate conversation to Ibn Mujahid. But uh, the, the concept of the Sabbat Ahruf, so just translating literally the seven letters, I mean, mm -hmm. is that a literal translation? I don't know. I'm not sure what literal means anymore, but. This the Quran being revealed in seven letters, which of course appears later in the Hadith. Um, uh, how does this connect? Uh, how does this connect to this whole conversation? I know it's a hu huge question, but how would you tackle that? I mean, from from my perspective, it's the, the the easy answer. There is no easy answer. I'm trying to make it easy. Is that this Hadith about Sabat Ahruf? It all it exists only to give legitimacy to the Qiraat. To the reading traditions uh, th that's all about it what it means uh, now whether when the hadith was circulating people knew what harf is and what ahruf um, uh, meant uh, or whether it's supposed to be ambiguous and vague we don't know probably a more a, a, if you want a historical uh, analysis of the word harf uh, starting from pre-islamic uh, uh, period and till the second century hijra, eighth century, ninth century, maybe it will shed light on that. But as far as we are concerned, we know that the hadith, the, the, the reason why the hadith was circulating is to give legitimacy to the differences in qiraat. And, and that's it. Now, is it fabricated? I don't know. I, I don't think so, that it was fabricated at, cert, at this certain point in time, because there are many variations to this hadith. So um, was it, I think it was started to be heavily circulating in a specific period of time, which is uh, late, uh, I would say mid, mid second century, which is mid uh, like 700, 750, 760s in a sense, uh, that people started circulating at. And it makes a lot of sense because this is the period where the Qiraat tradition uh, started to um, take shape, whether the eponymous readings or whether the copying of the masahif and people started to realize that there are many variations from one codex to another and from one reading to another so does does the popularity of the hadith regarding the the sabat ahruf the, the seven modes i think is that you translate it as mode is that your preferred uh, I, I think arthur jeffrey translated it as mode and mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i'm just taking his translation and i chose okay. mode of uh, taking it from him yeah okay so this hadith about the seven modes um in which the quran was um revealed um it, it, does does that correspond with the rise of the idea that all of the seven readings uh, identified by Ibn Mujahid, or maybe you'll correct me on that if maybe it's earlier. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. uh, do, does that correspond with the idea that they are all wahi, right? That uh, that they are all divine revelation? Well, okay, so yes and no. We'll start with the no first. There's no correlation between the seven readings and the seven ahruf. Okay, so that's one of the problems in the tradition, and that's one of the criticisms against Ibn Mujahid that he chose seven readings, making people think that the seven readings are the Sabbath. 
So there's no correlation whatsoever between the seven eponymous readings of Ibn Mujahid and or what we later on know as this Al Qiraat Sabah and the Sabat Ahad. So that's one. Two, yes, uh, whether they are seven or eight or nine or ten, any body of readings, any number of readings that Muslim scholars agreed, okay, or established a consensus that these are canonical readings, they are considered to be divine. Now, divine, it means that you can use them in prayers. And again, this is the important criterion. If you use any of the 10 readings in ritual prayer, your prayer is valid. If you choose any reading beyond the 10, uh, your prayer is invalid. So that's the that's the uh, the criterion. So, so what if, can I push you a little bit? What if we take yeah. a step a little bit earlier than Ibn mm -hmm. Mujahid? Uh, mm -hmm. Who does in 936? Um, uh, not, uh, 936, correct, yes. So what if we go back to Tabari, Abu Jafar al Tabari, mm -hmm. who I believe mm -hmm. that is in 923, so just a yeah. generation or two before. Uh, would Tabari have this sense that there are seven qira'at or more, which are more. wahi and others which are not wahi? So that this is the important uh, this, the important uh, distinction here is how scholars over the time thought about the readings. Later Muslim scholars thought about the readings as being wahi, as being revelation, or as being validated by the Prophet. The sense that we get from early scholars and er early grammarians that they were not considered wahi or revelation. It's a consensus of the readers that they read this or that way. <clears throat> so for a tabari. Uh, he had more. He had 20, 20 plus, I think, uh, readings. His book is lost, but he discusses that in his commentary. And many of the, the interesting part is when, when you start the progression, when you study the development of the readings, and you see that before Ibn Mujahid, many of the readings that Ibn Mujahid considered to be canonical or later on became canonical, they were rejected early on. And the best example of this is Hamza. The reading of Hamza, Zayyat, for a long time, it was rejected by even by Kufans. And you go to any of the early biographical uh, dictionaries on Hamza and you read about his uh, reading, people rejected it. They called it an innovation. Uh, and this is an established uh, part of the literature. I mean, the Zahabi, uh, the historian, he discusses that in, in the biography of Hamza. And he says, yes, Muslim scholars rejected the Zahabi. They rejected Hamza. Mm -hmm. They hated they hated his reading, they disliked it because of this and that. However, and the Dhabi was right here, the consensus now is to consider Hamza's reading valid or mutawatira in, in, in a sense. So it's important to, to, to know where we are historically. Are we before Tabari? Are we after Tabari? Are we post Abu Mujahid or before Abu Mujahid? Because Muslim scholars have different criteria. So during uh, Tabari's time, Probably no one was using Hamza in prayers. And uh, Ibn Qutayba says he has a very interesting remark about Hamza. Of course, he, he was criticizing him. He says, I'm, I'm amazed that Hamza reads one way but prays in another way. Meaning that he, he's criticizing him for devising or creating this, this, uh, his reading. And he says that, why doesn't Hamza, why doesn't he use it in prayer? And this is the criticism, is that you are trying to devise a new reading, but you are not using it in prayer, because probably you would know or people would realize that your reading is not um, considered divine or uh, your prayer will be invalid if you use it in prayers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I want to jump ahead to a, a modern question, and then I want to ask you a little bit about your, your books as well before we wrap up. But just a modern question. Um, and I mean, this is probably, you can only answer anecdotally. Uh, mm -hmm. I think there are no statistics on this, but um, I, what is your sense about um, the awareness of the idea that all of the readings are, um, or seven or maybe the 10 with Ibn al um, that they're, that they're all wahi, they're all divine revelation, all canonical, all licit for liturgical prayer um, in you know just the general Muslim public around the world today. So if you ask me before YouTube became popular and the internet, I would I would give you a different answer. I mean when, when I wrote when I wrote my first book and my, the dissertation there was no tube there were no uh, even the internet the whole discussion of qiraat and readings it was the people the majority of, of Muslims 
uh, educated Muslims, not necessarily educated as uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in in Islam as as a religion, edu educated university, educated uh, Muslims. They didn't. They really didn't know. I mean, I I I would say ninety five percent of Muslims uh, probably didn't know about the Qiraat. And even if you read. Uh, I mean, there is an interesting anecdote in one of the early, not early actually, um, Ottoman period Hanafi works of fiqh. Uh, the, um, they are giving an advice for imams when they are leading prayers in some distant places. And they say, do not uh, lead people in prayer and recite in readings that would make people laugh, such as the reading of Hamza or the reading of Abu Jafar of the tent read in a way that people would recognize okay so this is uh, an advice to the imam or to the to the person who's going to read other people in prayer people don't know about qiraat the the lay muslim the lay person uh, people who know about qiraat are only uh, pe people who took ijazas or had islamic education and they understand these things and even people who are uh, uh, who's, who's, the, the people who memorize the seven and the ten readings are very, very, very few, um, and they are able to uh, master them. Right, right. Now, after the internet, it's a different story. I think there are um, many uh, official and, and non-official, if you want, institutes. They are trying to uh, popularize uh, qiraat. They are there are many recordings now on the internet for the Qiraat. People are watching things on YouTube. Uh, uh, there are many even institutes in, um, in the Muslim world, uh, uh, professional Quran reciters who have YouTube channels on, uh, um, on reciting in different recitations. So our people are slowly getting used to that idea. Uh, so I would probably jump from 95% to maybe, I don't know, 60%, 70%, again, anecdotally, thanks to the internet. Interesting. Um, uh, it, it's now people, even people, they know that there are qiraat, uh, the educated Muslim, they not necessarily, they don't know exactly what the differences are, but at least now they know that there's such a thing as qiraat. And now the second stage is they have to get uh, to understand what these qiraat are. And um, and uh, that's, I think, the job of Muslim preachers and uh, uh, people who are leading Muslims in Friday prayers to try right. to explain right. to them what these qiraat are from a, um, a Muslim perspective, at least, not necessarily from an academic perspective. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. There's a, someone who's appeared on this channel is Jack Tanous of Princeton University, and he mm. has begun to popularize this concept of the simple believer, and um, he doesn't mean it in a pejorative way, right? Not that um, yeah. uh, certain people are smart and other people are simple, but rather that in uh, in religious knowledge, academics tend to focus on the the, the elites and the intellectuals, and uh, and in fact, the experience of most believers um, is of the basic or simple aspects of the faith, and they may not um, know these. This this would be interesting. Sort of case of his notion of the simple simple believer. Uh, yeah, I, maybe, I would agree with that, and in, in, in more or less. So yeah, yeah. yeah. And the theological questions is very interesting too, but yeah. uh, probably for another time. Uh, be, before I ask you about what you're up to now, just could, could you explain really briefly, just um, you know, what led you to focus in on Ibn Mujahid? I know we haven't spoken much about it. Ho hopefully, I'll get you yeah. back, and we will. Uh, no. But you know, why dedicate this 2020 book? Um, to Ibn Mujahid, um, yeah, why why did you focus in on that? What what led to the project? Yeah. What what have reactions been to it? Right. So the, I mean, to, probably two major uh, reasons. One is Ibn Mujahid's book is considered to be the prototype uh, for the seven readings. Okay. So he is the first one to um, I mean this, the the way he systematized this, the discipline is thanks to him. Uh, so this is the first full-fledged book on the seven readings where you have a, uh, a detailed description of the variants, who read what, and uh, he has uh, also a detailed description of the what we call the principles of recitation, the usul, how each reciter and also his students, how they were uh, pronouncing things and uh, the way articulating the letters, etc. And the second reason is a part of a project trying to, um, uh, uh, to, to 
probably capture the way that this, even the seven Qiraat, how they were systematized. So again, one of the misconceptions that um, uh, that we have is that the seven, the seven or the ten readings are stagnant; that they are the same today as they used to be uh, during Ibn Mujahid's time. And this is completely inaccurate because if you see the variants that Ibn Mujahid chose in his book, uh, there are many variants that they were different from how hundred years later on a shot to be uh, systematized. It's different from how it used to be later on. It's different from before Ibn Mujahid. And when we read more sources and we compare how each reader had many different students and the students of the eponymous readers, they also differ among each other slightly. Uh, so we get, a, we get a, a taste to know why Ibn Mujahid chose the seven, how he systematized them. And that's, that's part of the project, to try to track down the canonization process of the seven and the ten readings. So, Great. Yeah, terrific. Um, and uh, that's a major, that is a serious project. <laughs> Hopefully, we will see. Yes, yeah. There's a lot of work. And in fact, um, as a sort of final note, um, yeah, would you like to speak a little bit more about, you know, what you're up to now? Um, anything you want to share about your current research and projects? And also... Yeah. Um, you know, if there's ways that people could, um, you know, discover more of your work, stay in touch with what you're up to. Uh, sure. So, I mean, currently I am working on the uh, on the website um, Encyclopedia of the Variant Readings of the Quran. So that's an ongoing uh, uh, project, um, uh, ev or erquran.org. So this is part of the project where I'm trying to capture all the variant readings slash readings in most grammatical, exegetical uh, manuals of Qiraat in one set. Okay, uh, so this is um, every almost uh, there's data, new data on the website almost uh, every day. Um, so that's one part. It's just technical trying to uh, to put in the data there and uh, present it in a in a way that would be useful for people and. Uh, the, the other things I'm working on now is the um, uh, the Quranic uh, language vis-a-vis -vis poetic language. So it's a book I'm, I'm currently uh, writing. Hopefully it will be done by the end of the year. Uh, so it's mostly on, um, uh, if you want, unusual grammatical constructions in the Quran and how the different Qira'at traditions um, um, circumvent these uh, grammatical constructions and how they are compared to uh, to pre-Islamic poetry, uh, especially pre-Islamic poetry. So that's, uh, uh, if you want, a grammatical uh, uh, work, grammatical analysis of Quranic syntax vis-a-vis -vis, uh, poetic syntax. Terrific. Yeah. Great, great. And um, Shadi, could you, could you give the URL one more time for your, your uh, encyclopedia? Yeah, so it's uh, evqran.org. Uh, uh, or e r q r a n dot o r g. So, okay. I it's encyclopedia of the variant readings of the Quran. Or if you don't like the variant encyclopedia of the readings of the Quran, so I registered both domain for people who like the word variant and for people who don't like the word variant. So <laughs> right. even right. even the website even the website has a, a variant in uh, <laughs> in its address. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's yeah. been great speaking with you and. Um... Uh, I just encourage everyone to stay in touch with um, Dr. Nasser's work and um, find find his books. Uh, again, Transmission of the Variant Readings of the Quran from 2012 with Brill, the second canonization of the Quran 2020, um, also with with Brill, and stay in touch with uh, the project on the um, uh, on the website I just mentioned. So thank you so much, Shadi. Uh, good to be with you. Thank, thank you, Gabriel. It was a pleasure. It was fun. Thank you. Well, friends, thanks for being with us for this episode of Exploring the Quran and the Bible. I hope you found it to be an edifying discussion. I really hope that you find generally the, um, the content on this channel to be useful. There's a really diverse range of things um, reg in regard to Quranic studies and biblical studies with top-notch scholars. And um, we'll would be really grateful for your support. So please don't hesitate to like the videos starting with this one maybe, to subscribe to the channel and to share the news with your friends about exploring the Quran and the Bible.